Hi dancers, it's Miss Michelle. Today our read aloud is about a dancer and choreographer named Alvin Ailey. The author of this book is Andrea Davis Pinckney and the illustrations are by Brian Pinckney. Alvin Ailey. Nineteen forty two, True Vine Baptist Church. It seemed like the hottest day ever in Navasota, Texas, the small, dusty town where Alvin Ailey and his mother, Lula, lived. Blue black flies buzzed their songs while the church bell rang. Alvin and Lula worshiped at True Vine Baptist Church every Sunday. When they arrived for services, Alvin slid into his usual seat in the first row pew. There he could watch his mother sing in the gospel choir. And Lula sure could sing. Her voice rose clear and strong as she sang the morning hymn. The men at Truvine dressed in dignified suits. The women showed off wide-brimmed hats and fanned away the Texas heat. Some cuddled powdered babies, others hugged their Bibles. True Vine's Reverend Lewis delivered a thundering sermon. The organ rang out, followed by a bellow of tenors singing, Rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham. Sweet sopranos and tambourines joined the rousing refrain. Rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham. Rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham. Rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham. Oh, rock of my soul. The congregation made a joyful noise. They stepped and swayed with the warmth of the spirit and raised their palms in revelation. Alvin stomped his feet and clapped his hands so hard they hurt. Oh, rock of my soul, he sang along. Alvin was going to miss the music and rejoicing at True Vine Baptist Church. Days later, Alvin rode a creaky locomotive headed west. He and Lula were going to try life in Los Angeles, California. Times had been hard in Texas. There weren't many jobs. Lula wanted a better life for Alvin. She told him there were more opportunities in the city more ways to make a decent living. Alvin stared out his window while the train rocked and lurched its way through the dry Texas land. Life in the city would be so different. Nineteen forty five to nineteen forty seven Los Angeles. Los Angeles was a flashy, flashy town. Lula found plenty of work. Most mornings she left their apartment on East 43rd place before sunrise, and she didn't return home until the sun was long past setting. Alvin didn't mind, though. On Saturdays and after school, he liked spending time alone, exploring the city streets. He strolled Central Avenue, where nightclubs such as the Club Alabama boomed with the sounds of big band jazz swinging music that spilled out into the street while the musicians inside rehearsed for the evening show. Alvin especially liked downtown Los Angeles, where the lights on the theater houses reflected off the pavement. There was the Orpheum Theater, the Biltmore, the Rosebud, and the Lincoln. Outside each theater, a blinking marquee announced the latest show. Pearl Bailey performing live, Billie Holiday, A Night of Blues, Duke Ellington and his band. The men who owned the theater stacked handbills on their stoops. Each handbill announced coming attractions. Alvin collected them all. 
He dawdled along the sidewalk and spotted a handbill showing a black dancer, something Alvin had never seen advertised before. The paper said, coming soon to the Biltmore Theater, Catherine Dunham and her dancers in Tropical Review. Alvin looked carefully at the picture of Catherine Dunham, a beautiful dancer fluttering exotic ruffles. Catherine Dunham and her dance troupe were one of the few traveling shows in the world with black dancers performing dances from Africa, Haiti, and Latin America. Alvin was curious. As he tucked the announcement into his pocket, he noticed Ted Crumb, a skinny boy with spindly legs, hanging out at a stage door nearby. Ted knew all kinds of things about dance. He hoped to dance on stage someday. Ted told Alvin that Katherine Dunham's afternoon show was about to start and that they could see dancing like they'd never seen before. Alvin and Ted crept down the alley that led to the Biltmore stage entrance. They kept quiet and out of sight. With the stage door opened just so, they watched the splendor of Tropical Review. Katherine Dunham and her dancers swirled and lunged to the rhythms of West Indian drums. They were famous for Bahania, a spicy Brazilian routine, and for a sizzling number called rumba with a little jive mixed in. Alvin's soul danced along when he saw Katherine Dunham's style. Alvin nudged Ted. What is that they're doing? What is that? He asked. That's modern dancing, Ted said. Watch this. Ted tried Katherine Dunham's behind ya. Alvin slapped out a beat on his knees and followed Ted's lead. Slowly, Alvin began to move. He curled his shoulders from back to front and rippled his hands like an ocean wave. He rolled his hips in an easy, steady swivel, dancing with an expression all his own. Alvin moved like a cat, smooth like quicksilver. When he danced, Happiness glowed warm inside him. Dusk crept over the city. The streetlights of Central Avenue winked on one by one. Alvin made his way back to East 43rd place. That night, Alvin told his mother he'd seen black people performing their own special dances. It was a show Alvin would never forget. Nineteen forty nine to nineteen fifty three. Lester Horton's Dance School. More than anything, Alvin wanted to study dance. But when Alvin arrived in Los Angeles, not everyone could take dance lessons. In nineteen forty nine, not many dance schools accepted black students, and almost none taught the fluid moves that Alvin liked so much. Almost none but the Lester Horton Dance Theater School a modern dance school that welcomed students of all races. Lester's door was open to anyone serious about learning to dance. At age 18, Alvin Ailey was serious, especially when he saw how Lester's dancers moved. One student, Carmen de Lavalade, danced with a butterfly's grace. Another, James Truitt, made modern dance look easy. But Lester worked his students hard Sometimes they danced all day. After hours in the studio, droplets of sweat dotted Alvin's forehead. He tingled inside, ready to try Lester's steps once more. At first, Alvin kept time to Lester's beat and followed Lester's moves. Then Alvin's own rhythm took over and he started creating his own steps. Alvin's tempo worked from his belly to his elbows, then oozed through his thighs and feet. Oh, I forgot to show you the picture for this page. This is a picture of Alvin Ailey at Lester Horton School. And they danced all day long.
What is Alvin doing? One student asked. Whatever he's doing, he's sure doing it fine, two dancers agreed. Some tried to follow Alvin's moves, but even Alvin didn't know which way his body would reel him next. Alvin's steps flowed from one to another. His loops and spins just came to him, the way daydreams do. Alvin danced at Lester Horton's school almost every day. He taught the other students his special moves. In 1950, Alvin joined Lester Horton's dance company. Soon, Alvin performed his own choreography for small audiences who gathered at Lester's studio. Alvin's dances told stories. He flung his arms and shim-shammed his middle to express jubilation. His dips and slides could even show anger and pain. Modern dance let Alvin's imagination whirl. All the while, Lester watched Alvin grow into a strong dancer and choreographer. Lester told Alvin to study and learn as much as he could about dance. He encouraged Alvin to use his memories and his African-American heritage to make dances that were unforgettable. Nineteen fifty eight to nineteen sixty Blues Sweet Revelations Alvin's satchel hung heavy on his shoulder. His shoes wrapped a beat on the sidewalk while taxi cabs honked their horns. He was glad to be in New York City, where he came to learn ballet from Carol Shook and modern dance techniques from Martha Graham, two of the best teachers in the world. Alvin took dance classes all over town, and he met dancers who showed him moves he'd never seen before. So many dancers were black. Like Alvin, their dreams soared higher than New York's tallest skyscrapers. Alvin gathered some of the dancers he'd seen in classes around the city. He chose the men and women who had just the right moves to dance his choreography. Alvin told them he wanted to start a modern dance company that would dance to blues and gospel music, the heritage of African American people. Nine dancers believed in Alvin's idea. This was the beginning of the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. On March 30th, 1958, on an old wooden stage at the 92nd Street Y, Alvin and his friends premiered with Blue's Suite, dances set in a honky-tonk dance hall. Stage lights cast moody shadows against the glimmer of each dancer's skin. The women flaunted red-hot dresses with shoes and stockings to match. The men wore black hats slouched low on their heads. They danced to the swanky swank of a jazz rhapsody. Alvin's choreography depicted the blues, that weepy sadness all folks feel now and then. Blue sweet stirred every soul in the room. Alvin was on his way to making it big. Word spread quickly about him and his dancers. Newspapers hailed Alvin. Radio stations announced his debut. An even bigger thrill came when the 92nd Street Y asked Alvin to perform again. He knew they hardly ever invited dance companies to come back. Alvin was eager to show off his next work. On January 31st, 1960, gospel harmonies filled the concert hall at the 92nd Street Y. Rock, 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 rock of my soul, oh, rock of my soul. Alvin clapped in time to the music, the same way he did when he was a boy. But now Alvin rejoiced on stage in Revelations, a suite of dances he created to celebrate the traditions of True Vine Baptist Church in Navasota, Texas. The audience swayed in their seats as Alvin and his company gloried in their dance. High-stepping ladies appeared on stage sweeping their skirts. They danced with grace and haughty attitudes. 
Alvin and the other men jumped lively to their rhythm, strutting and dipping in sassy revelry. Revelations honored the heart and the dignity of black people while showing that hope and joy are for everyone. With his sleek moves, Alvin shared his experiences and his dreams in a way no dancer had ever done. When Revelations ended, the audience went wild with applause. They stomped and shouted, more, they yelled, more. Taking a bow, Alvin let out a breath. He raised his eyes toward heaven, satisfied and proud. Here is a picture of Alvin Ailey later in life. His dance company still exists today. That's all for today, dancers. I love you.